Good evening, welcome to this roundtable discussion, Networks of Knowledge on Asia, hosted by the University of the Philippines Asian Center. We would like to acknowledge the attendance of representatives from different schools, foundations, NGOs, universities in the Philippines and abroad, and also embassies who are with us today. To formally open uh, today's event, let's welcome the president of the University of the Philippines, Professor Danilo L. Concepcion. To the participants of the UP Asian Center Roundtable, we welcome you to the University of the Philippines. It is an honor to host this forum of distinguished international scholars, and I wish you fruitful exchanges, valuable connections, and more explicit contexts and directions for your studies. It is my hope that the knowledge you share during this roundtable discussion will enrich the intellectual frameworks for exploring the expanding landscape of Asian studies. Your discussions will undoubtedly reveal invaluable insights for sustained scholarship. It is our university's mandate as a national, regional, and global university to promote knowledge sharing and network building. Hence, the links between your institutions and the university will become more profound and more multidimensional as the years go by. It warms our hearts to have you all under the auspices of the UP Asian Center doing just that. Aided by your work, may the path to more remarkable engagements among our peoples be straighter and development partnerships among our countries more focused and effective. Mabuhay po kayo. Thank you, President Concepcion. To give us a brief overview of the roundtable, we have Professor Antoinette Rakiza, who also serves as an assistant to the Dean for Public Affairs of the University of the Philippines Asian Center. Good evening. I will actually make this really brief. Uh, today's roundtable, today's roundtable discussion brings together leading figures 
from various international networks and organizations to, that promote the study of Asia. These networks not only organize regional and international meetings and conferences, but also participate in setting the agenda and the directions for Asian studies. This roundtable seeks to understand the broader landscape of Asian studies in different parts of the world and its involvement with various institutions and epistemic traditions. It also aims to foreground the changing dynamics of Asia, of area studies and its continuing importance in the broader public sphere. The Asian Center is for, fortunate to host this rare meeting of academic organizations and intellectuals from different continents, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and North America. We have nine speakers from eight, uh, from eight uh, academic networks, namely the Asian Political and in, in, uh, International Studies Association, Association of Asia Scholars, Association for Asian Studies, Consortium for Southeast Asia Studies in Southeast Asia, European Association for Southeast Asian Studies, International Institute for Asian Studies, International Political Science Association, and the Latin American Association of Asian and African Studies. The discussion this evening revolve around three themes. How, first, how the different organizations and networks engage the study of, South, of Asia. Second, the issues and challenges that confront Asianists. And third, steps on how to enrich and deepen engagements with Asia. To proceed with our roundtable discussion, I'd like to turn over the floor to Dr. Ariel Lopez, who will introduce the speakers and start the conversation going. Maraming salamat. Thank you, Professor Akiza. As mentioned, we have a full house. We have eight speakers from uh, seven networks. First, um, let me introduce to the, um, one by one. First, we have uh, Dr. Angeline Chang, who is chair of the Research Committee on Asian and Pacific Studies of the International Political Science Association. She is also editor of the Rutledge Handbook of Asia in World Politics and professor of law at the Cleveland Marshall College of Law, Cleveland State University in the US. She is additionally the first pianist of Asian descent, as well as the first American female pianist to win a Grammy Award. She furthers future generations of political scientists through the International Association for Political Science Students in Politics and Governance and Youth and Civic Engagement for IAPSS Asia through UN 75 consultations. <clears throat> Second, we have um, Dr. Jeronimo Delgado Caicedo, Secretary General of the Asociación Latinoamericana de Estudios de Asia y África, or the Latin American Association for Asian and African Studies. He is also founding member of the Latin American Network of Africanists. He is the Director of the African Studies and of the Observatory for the Analysis of International Systems, both at the Universidad Externado de Colombia in Bogota. He has PhD in Geography from the University of Cape Town in South Africa and Master's in International Relations from a joint program between the Colombian Diplomatic Academy and also the University of Paris in Sorbonne. Third, we have uh, Dr. Hilary Vanessa Finchamsung, who is the Executive Director of the Association uh, for Asian Studies, the largest global academic association dedicated to the study of Asia. Prior to her position at AAS, she served as Associate Professor of Ethnomusicology in the Department of Korean Music and Associate Dean of Students in Seoul National University's College of Music. Fin Cham Sung's academic work has centered on Korean music with a recent focus on the roles of women in sustaining traditional expressive cultures in the Southwest of Korea. Fourth is Dr. Brendan Howe, President of Asian Political and International Studies Association and Dean and Professor at Iwa Women's University Graduate School of International Studies. His research, his research focuses on East Asian security, human security, comprehensive peace building, among others. He has co-authored co -authored or edited 90 related publications. Some of the latest include the Niche Diplomacy of Asian Middle Powers 2021 UN Governance, 
Peace and Human Security in Cambodia in Timor Leste 2020, among many other publications. Fifth, we have uh, Dr. Shin Wang Michael Shao, Chairperson of the Consortium for Southeast Asian Studies, or CISHA, and of the Consortium of Global Hakka Studies. He's also chairman of um, different organizations in different universities in Taiwan, including the Center for Southeast Asian Studies in, Nation in National Chengchi University, and also the Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation. Um, he's also an adjunct research fellow at uh, the Institute of Sociology in Academia Sinica, and also an honorary chair professor of Southeast Asian Studies at National Jinan International University. Moreover, he currently serves as a senior advisor to the president of Taiwan since 2016. Sixth, we have Dr. Philip Pekam, the director of the International Institute of Asian Studies, Leiden University in the Netherlands. He's a historian of Southeast Asia, his first monograph, The Birth of v Vietnamese Political Journalism, Saigon 1960 to 1930, published by Columbia University Press, uh, which traced the origins of Vietnamese public culture of contestation during the colonial period. For 10 years, he worked to establish a dual academic civic organization in post-war Cambodia, the Center for Khmer Studies, about which he has written uh, a book uh, in Cultural Renewal in Cambodia, Cam Academic Activism in the Neoliberal Era, published by Braille in 2020. Seventh, we have uh, Dr. Lia Rodriguez de la Vega, past general secretary of the Latin American Association for Asian and African Studies and also national coordinator of the, uh, for the Argentine section of uh, this organization. She is also vice director of the Asian Affairs Committee of the Argentine Council for International Relations. She is an expert on Hinduism, yoga, and did postdoctoral post -doctoral studies at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Porto Alegre, Brazil, and at the Department of Germanic and Roman Studies at the University of Delhi. Finally, we have Dr. Silvia Vignato, President of the European Association for Southeast Asian Studies. She is Associate Professor of Anthropology at the Universidad di Milano Bicocca. Uh, and besides a monograph about Sumatran Hinduism, uh, she has numerous um, articles, including about uh, Malaysian factory workers and post-conflict and post-disaster young Achenese people. She has also directed um, a few films, uh, including Rezeki Gold and Stone Mining in Aceh and Aceh After, uh, both released in 2020. So um, I, I would like to, you know, after this, uh, you know, quite longish uh, bio notes, I think uh, it's time to, to proceed to the round table. So now we proceed to the round table, we'll have three rounds of Q&A. Uh, based on these three themes, namely how different organizations, networks engage in the study of Asia. Second, the issues and challenges faced by scholars of Asia. And finally, steps on how to enrich and deepen engagement with Asia. So each speaker uh, may have three, around three minutes to answer the questions for each theme. And after each round, there will be a brief open, open for all discussion for clarificatory and follow-up remarks. And finally, there'll be an open forum where the audience's questions can be answered. Um, and a note for the audience, uh, please take note that questions can be posted via your Q&A box. Uh, and you can also raise your hand to signify your interest to ask via live video and audio. However, due to time constraints, only a handful of live questions can be accommodated. So the first theme um, that we would like you to answer, the speakers, is about your organization. So how would you characterize your organization's networks or engagements with Asia and Asian studies? And why do you think international scholarly networks and organizations are important in engaging with Asia? And how could direct people-to-people -people interaction and network-to-network -network collaboration be further strengthened? So I guess we could start with uh, Professor Chan. Angeline? If. Sure. Thank you so much, Professor Lopez. It's a great honor and privilege to be here for the 66th anniversary of this of your organization. It's great to be at the Asian Center, and um, 
at the University of Philippines today. It's quite early for me, my time, but to give you a brief on the organization that I'm representing today, it's the International Political Science Organization Research Committee on Asian and Pacific Studies. Now, the International Political Science Association, or IPSA, is a world organization dedicated to the study of political science. Under this umbrella, there are national organizations such as the American Political Science Association, Philippine Political Science Association, and so forth. Now, the Research Committee on Asian and Pacific Studies, also known as IPSA RC18, was established 45 years ago in 1976, exactly 45 years ago. Before that, the landscape in political science was very Eurocentric. And this Research Committee began as a uh, IPSA study group became a research committee on Asian studies, then later expanded to include the Pacific. Its special emphasis is on studies and relations between Asian countries and influence in the whole world. Today, it holds among the most popular and numerous panels at each IPSA World Congress. I serve as chair, and there are currently 12 other elected board members from across the world, including scholars in East, Southeast, and South Asia, Europe, North, and South America. Uh, I'm not sure if you, uh, Professor Lopez, would you like me to continue on with the other two questions or? Um, yes, please. Oh, sure, sure, certainly. So, um, uh, well, regarding the uh, international uh, scholarly uh, networks and organizations and why they're important in engaging with Asia. I, I believe that it, it gives structure and reach beyond the individual. Yet while the organization is solid, IPSA and uh, our RC uh, Research Committee, um, it's important to scholars and policy implementers alike. The area and research in the committee, for example, exists from the vision and perseverance of actually one person, um, a professor of political science at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, in the United States, by the name of Dr. Taekwong Chang, Zhang De Guang, who founded this research committee on Asian and Pacific Studies. He's, he's a living legend and uh, has been a full-time professor for about 55 years and now in his mid-90s, just retired as the pandemic hit. And by the way, I, I spoke to him earlier and he sends his best regards for our round table today and our event. So you see one person can and does make a difference. And organizations help provide that structure and uh, house where others are welcome to visit or live and help build further and maintain mutual interest. International scholarly networks and organizations are indeed important as a vehicle for engaging in Asia. However, it's only as good as the drivers and people involved in effective collaboration. So how could people to people interaction and network to network collaborations be strengthened? Well, uh, the, the board of the research committee on Asian and Pacific studies at IPSA, for example, is exceptional. Um, one great example is our board member and our mutual friend here today, Dr. Brendan Howe who's Dean and Professor at Iwa Uni um, Women's University in Korea. He was the one who brought us together so we could be here together at this event. And that's an excellent example of how people to people and networks happen and how we continue to build and strengthen in awareness and collaborations through networks and people. So to help strengthen. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I also invite you to uh, consider presenting your papers so forth in our next World Congress. And I'll be happy to provide my personal information for you to, to contact further. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, th thank you, Professor Chang. I think it's important. It's, it's interesting that you pointed out how one person can make a difference in, in making these uh, collaborations happen. So maybe we, uh, we can hear from Professor Delgado Caicedo on his thoughts about um, the importance of organizations and networks. Thank you very much for your invitation. Um, again, it's very early here as well, so I apologize for uh, if my English is not perfect at this time. Um, for you to know, um, Alada was created in 1976 um, at Ecole Hill Mexico, uh, de Mexico in Mexico City within the framework of the 30th International Congress of Human Sciences of Asia and North Africa. Since then, it's been an expanding uh, organization within Latin America 
There is a little bit of a difference between Alada and the rest of the organizations uh, present here today. And it's the fact that Alada not only focuses on, on Asian studies, but it also works with African studies as well. Um, our organization um, is quite particular because we have a, a general uh, secretary, like the secretary general for the whole continent, but we also have 11 national chapters um, all throughout Latin America, all the way from Mexico to Argentina. And we are currently creating another one in Bolivia at the moment, so we will be 12 um, very soon. Um, and what we do is um, we provide spaces for researchers in Latin America to exchange their knowledge production on Africa and Asian studies. We have a Congress, uh, an international Congress every two years. And then every two years as well, we have national Congress in each one of the 11 chapters. And that allows for, for a permanent uh, exchange of information. Um, the thing is uh, for us, uh, Asia and Africa have been historically absent in the foreign policies of, of our, our countries. So what we were trying to do is to put Asia and Africa back on the agenda of our own governments. And uh, from academia, we're trying to, to work on that. Um, as for the second question, um, we believe that international scholarly networks and organizations are important because they ensure contact between colleagues and students building knowledge on Asia from our own countries, uh, attending to uh, their own views and even questioning um, ex ex existing study categories. Um, for us in a region where Asia and Africa have not been historically important, but are growing slowly in important, networks allow us for a joint work and the strengthening of, of quality research for us. They also allow us for the, the exchange of ideas and research, research findings. And um, for Latin America, scholarly networks are crucial in stimulating the study of Asian uh, languages as well, which, are, which is an, uh, an extremely important element for us. Um, given that we are working in Spanish and Portuguese mainly, um, that actually sets a, uh, creates a big wall for us to, to, to access information. Um, in fact, for the first time in our history, we started having uh, panels in Asian languages in our last uh, conference with Asian colleagues. Um, the time difference doesn't really help us. So the panels were very ungodly hours, but uh, we're starting to, to work on that. And finally, um, as for how could di uh, direct people to people interaction and network to network uh, collaboration be strengthened? Um, we believe that, at least for us, in a continent where Asia and Af Asian and African studies uh, are usually the, we are the, the weird ones because people are usually studying the US or Europe or Latin America. We're, we're not the, we don't, use the, we don't do the usual research. For us, it's quite important to committing to organize and sustain regular activities with an established uh, frequency that allow us to take advantage of social uh, of, of these networks between people and organizations and even using social networks to maintain a permanent contact. Um, that has allowed us to create sub networks within our organization for specific countries and regions. We, we have a specific sub networks for, a, for China, Japan, Korea, India, and now we have a new one for Southeast Asia. And we believe that um, joint work between scholars in Latin America on specific topics uh, through ALADA is crucial to, to advance in, in, in quality research. Um, we also make sure to know what other colleagues are producing on Africa and Asia and guaranteeing spaces for them to present their findings. And finally, we believe it's a great opportunity for joint uh, work, for, for joint research, joint publications uh, that allows to, to, yes, work together um, in, in an academic environment where sometimes we feel like we are quite alone at our universities. So it's, it's actually quite an interesting way of working. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Thank Professor you. Delgado Caicedo. So I think it's important that you pointed out some of uh, the his language, no? um, as, and also the um, 
historical barriers to connecting between uh, Latin America and and Asia, um, with these two continents, you know, and looking to different areas uh, historically, so we're not in the immediate radar of each other. Um, so we have Professor Ho, Brendan Ho, of uh, the International uh, Asian Political International Studies Association. Thank you very much. It's great to be back at the Asian Center in the Philippines, if only virtually. Uh, I hope I can be back there in person in the near future. Uh, APISA is the association dealing with Asian political and international studies, very broadly defined. Uh, we want to be as inclusive as possible. So uh, we have academics, students, practitioners, uh, and where possible, we offer free or subsidized events, such as the current Congress that we're halfway through. This is our 15th Congress. Uh, APISO was founded 20 years ago, and initially the Congresses were every two years but uh, recently we've stepped it up to every year. Uh, the Congresses are held throughout Asia. We, we've had Congresses in West Asia, in Ankara, in South Asia, New Delhi, uh, and several times in, in Northeast and Southeast Asia in different countries. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we're, we're fairly broad based, but we do focus primarily on serving those who are in Asia, as well as those interested in Asia from other communities. Uh, at the moment, So Pong Po, who's from Cambodia originally, but is now a very esteemed professor in Canada, uh, he's defected from the International Studies Association uh, to APISA, and he regularly attends our conferences, so he'll be presenting tomorrow morning uh, at one of our panels. And this leads to the, the question about networking. Uh, we perceive ourselves to be a network of networks already. Uh, and certainly we work as closely as possible with all other partner networks. So we are represented on WISC, the World International Studies Conference. Uh, as already mentioned, we have a presence at IPSA. Uh, we also work very closely with KISA and also with the Philippine Political Science Association for, for joint conferences and publications. I think in terms of, of what are most important about the work uh, carried out by Asian associations generally, uh, the unique epistemological perspectives from this region and from people writing on this region that we, we get away from the, the Western dominated or Eurocentric perspectives uh, that, that we find elsewhere, uh, as Angeline already mentioned. Um, what we also try to do in APISA is promote local scholarship, uh, especially local conferences, but also capacity building workshops, uh, also supporting local publication initiatives so trying to raise the standard of, of regional journals, uh, also book publishing with major international publishing houses, but sourcing as many of the authors as possible uh, from within the, the community. In terms of strengthening people-to-people -people interaction, I mean, one of the positive side effects, I suppose, of the COVID pandemic is that we've all learned how to use Zoom. Uh, so there, there's a lot more virtual networking but really i don't think this is a true substitute for meeting in person to to thrash out joint research agendas for instance so i i think it's important where possible to support each other to attend each other's conferences uh reach out through through research and publication initiatives uh, in order to go beyond mere talking shops and this is a, an area that I've been particularly active in, is the idea of, of pushing to get product, that it, it shouldn't just be meeting and talking, which we seem to do an awful lot of as academics, uh, that we, we really need to focus our minds in terms of uh, a book project or a special issue of a journal or whatever it be, so that we can actually unify around a particular theme, whatever, that theme may be, but just to concentrate the minds far more so than if we just meet and talk. 
Yeah, thanks, Professor. I think um, it's important that you say that, you know, face-to-face um, -face meeting uh, will, um, it, it's indispensable you know, for, for uh, network to network uh, collaboration, even though we already learned how to Zoom. Um, but you have also um, mentioned uh, doing away with Euro, Euro, yeah, pers uh, Eurocentric perspectives. And also perhaps uh, you mentioned defected uh, or get from the wonder, competition or the, the possible delusion of, of, um, of the market, so to speak. But um, let's go to that later. Uh, now we go to Professor uh, Michael Shaw. Professor, you are muted. Kindly un unmute your self please okay thank now. you can you hear me yes good good i'm glad to be here and to align with you all um let me briefly introduce the c asia the full name is a consortium of southeast asian studies in asia two keywords consortium by, by, by definition our members are institutions that's why we don't call association our members are institutions, and we have 15 Southeast Asian Studies institutions. So uh, the second keyword, in Asia. So it's a regional-based Southeast Asian Studies. So we have, uh, we have uh, 15 institutions in 11 national locations. Taiwan had uh, three institutions, Singapore three, Japan one, Philippines one, Thailand one, Indonesia one, Korea one, Cambodia one, uh, Brunei one, China one, and Hong Kong one. And in Asia, that means we also try to have a dialogue between and among the, th the different uh, sub areas. For example, we have the Northeast Asia region, we have a Southeast Asia, a Southeast Asian region. So we try to generate, promote the dialogue of Southeast Asian studies down in Northeast Asia and down in Southeast Asia. So I think that is a, the uniqueness of our C Asia. Now, uh, it is a, a network, a network consortium a, a organization. And uh, we have, we organize uh, two kinds of activities for networking. One is a biennial, every other year, uh, the biennial big conference. The first one, it was in Kyoto. Oh, by the way, the Asia was established, well, we, we are relatively uh, new, 2015. Uh, so 2017, we held the, con the, the conference in Bangkok. And 2019, in Taipei, Academia Sinica. And due to the pandemic, so 2021, this year, we skip it. And but we will resume the biannual conference next year in Jakarta. And the preparation is underway. And we do hope with the help of whatever you call it, and the pandemic can be gone so we can meet together in Jakarta instead of online only. Um, so this is the uh, networks. Uh, 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 Consortium. Now, this the second thing I think important is uh, we focus on Southeast Asian studies in within Asia, and uh, doesn't mean other area will be excluded. But we really want to generate we call Southeast Asian studies local knowledge. I think it's very important for Southeast Asian scholars to study Southeast Asia, and let also that the Northeast Asian scholar to study Southeast Asia. And those so that the two kinds of a South Asian study cannot be compared. Eventually, I think the C Asia might go on to extend to South Asia. But at this moment, we focus only Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia. So I think that's a uniqueness because we don't want to focus on just on annual conference, big conference like a Big carnival, but we really, really focus on what you study about South Asia and what we study of South East Asia. Now, number three on the people to people networking, I think it's a, just like a, every other association. We focus very much on, on the, uh, the personal interpersonal networking. 
but we have a one uniqueness. I think we really much focus on young scholars, the emerging scholar, scholars in, the, in, in Asia. So we have a three mechanisms. In every other year, we will have a big conference. But in between, we will have a young scholar workshop. And the, the young scholarship workshop has been done, has, was organized once in Taipei in 2018. And then because of pandemic and because of other uh, financial constraints, we haven't done it yet, but we will resume again, uh, as maybe late next year. Uh, we have a three organization uh, very eager to sponsor uh, uh, in different form of the Young Scholar Dialogue and, uh, and uh, networking. One by uh, Taiwan, uh, so Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation, we will sponsor the Young Scholar Conferences or workshops and Kyoto, University of Tokyo's Emerging Scholar Conversations. They're pretty much online uh, uh, dis discuss discussion series. And then the other one is ARI, that's in Singapore, the ARI's Graduate Student Fellowship. So if we have to say something about the, our uniqueness of this people to people, we focus on very much on young scholars because the, the future of Asian studies lies on the future of the young scholars. So I think that, that's all I have to say about Sea Asia. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Shaw. I think it's interesting that you said that Sea Asia is, will uh, look to expanding its membership, not only in Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, but also to South Asia. Um, and also it's good to note now, that the Asian Center of the University of the Philippines is a founding member of this consortium. Um, next, we have uh, Pro uh, Professor Dr. Philip Baker um, of the International Institute for Asian Studies, Leiden University, who I understand is uh, also attending another meeting. And so we are very fortunate uh, that he touched us with his presence today. Well, thank you, Ariel, and uh, good, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, I don't know, to all the participants. Uh, um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, just I would like to go straight to do the question. The first question, how would you characterize your organization network? Okay, IAS, my institute, the Institute of International Institute for Asian Studies, is itself based on a, on a consortium originally of universities within the Netherlands. But it, uh, I would say that it is a kind of a strange um, a speech in the sense that we have a very broad open mandate. The, the main uh, characteristic of IES is very much to facilitate, um, and and we do it by uh, a number of, of through a number of, of um, activities and 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 around a, a range of functions. One is of course to facilitate research, so we have a, a wide range of fellowship uh, international fellowships uh, um, uh, that uh, you know um, that op is operated uh, through IES. We support also, um, they are postdoctoral uh, fellowship mostly. We also uh, engage very much now with um, educational uh, uh, projects and facilitating educational and teaching programs. So for instance, we have a big uh, program on called Humanities Across Borders, which is quite radical, which aim to, um, to develop, to devise an alternative humanistic educational program that is based on local embedded knowledge uh, and, and then shared at the global level. And, and it includes uh, partners from, from Asia, but also from Africa, from Latin America, uh, North America and, and Europe. Um, uh, and we also do other activities around, uh, around education. Uh, I don't have time. Uh, we are very much also engaged in, in dissemination of, 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 uh, of knowledge through publications I mean, uh, and through our newsletter, I think, uh, which is quite lo known, the, international, the, the IS newsletter, which has a, a, a readership of about 70,000 people worldwide. It's free. Uh, 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 it can be uh, you know, accessed online or uh, through a paper format. Uh, we also engage, uh, one of our other functions is what I would call a local institutional uh, uh, building activities, uh, um, and we work very much, uh, though we work globally, we work very much at the local level with partners, and we engage on, on local 
uh, situated uh, uh, um, activities and, 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 and projects. And by the way, we try to move beyond uh, the academic uh, realm. So we really work increasingly into uh, uh, breaking the barriers, the institutional barriers between what is considered as academic and what is uh, very much uh, social, communal, local. And, and, and uh, finally, I mean, in that uh, perspective, of course, we support a number of what we call networks, but I would say I would call rather communities. Uh, um, so the largest one, the most visible one is uh, ICAST, the International Convention for Asia Scholars, which uh, operates every two years uh, uh, somewhere in Asia or in the world. Uh, um, and yeah, so I think our engagement with Asia is very much Asia in the world. Uh, um, and, and we have tried in the last few uh, years to embed these conferences more locally and not to be just uh, uh, some kind of uh, disconnected events from, from the, the, the reality in which they take place. Uh, that beyond this, a number of initiatives have, have sprung up, I mean, that are more specific. One very important that I would, call, uh, I would uh, point out also in relation to our colleagues from Alada is that we are facilitating an Africa-Asia platform. Uh, uh, we've helped together with colleagues from Africa to establish a, a Pan-African network on Asian studies. And every three years, but that, okay, that was before COVID, every three years we facilitate a big conference in Africa on Asian studies. Uh, um, now, okay, we hope to have the next one in Senegal. Uh, the, the previous one took place in, in Tanzania. Uh, and, and these are very important uh, events, very cathartic events, because, uh, for instance, a number of networks have been uh, developed around these, these platforms, like a Southeast Asia Africa platform, a Central Asia Africa platform, etc. cetera. Um, and then we are involved in a number of more specific things, like we have a whole Southeast Asia, since we talk about Southeast Asia uh, very much, uh, Southeast Asia uh, neighborhood network, where we, whereby we facilitate the creation of, of I would say, um, ecosystems in which universities, local communities, local groups are working together and then putting them in relation to each other. So what I would say is that um, the, uh, yeah, IS is very much built as a public service. Uh, it has, as I mentioned, a, a global uh, agenda, even though it is often locally uh, based. It is for, uh, of course, initiated from Europe, but with the idea that uh, there is a multi-centered process of knowledge production uh, that in includes Asia, of course, because Asia is the topic we're talking about, but Asia in the world, because Asia is also in Europe, is also, we are all Asian somehow. So we try to very much uh, build on this, uh, you know, um, entanglement uh, dimension and recognizing it as, as today's uh, real uh, reality. Uh, we work always collaboratively. And um, yeah, I would just uh, say that um, to, in order to answer the, 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 the other questions, uh, we are always open uh, to developing new collaborations. Uh, uh, again, around this idea of public service and, 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 and um, and, and, and capacity building at all levels, different levels. I don't know if I, maybe I'm a bit vague, uh, but um, yeah, uh, could you direct people to people interaction? Of course, I agree with my previous colleagues. We, we very much support people, people and network to network interactions. But of course, we like to do that in person. Uh, we really want to, uh, like uh, my colleagues, to take a stand in favor of maintaining this capacity for us to get together and not to operate only online. Uh, mm -hmm. So much happens between and behind uh, uh, scenes and, and we need to continue on that and to support that. So uh, we don't know yet uh, mm -hmm. about the next ICAST for instance, but we plan to have it in person again. Yes, yeah. so IAS organizes the biannual ICAST. It's, it's also interesting um, that IAS is working to sort of circumvent that um, artificial divide between the academe and, and, and the society uh, by really opening up you know, the, the university or the academe, so to speak, and also by imagining Asia beyond its um, conventional geographic definition. As you say, we are 
somehow all the Asians. Uh, but we have to go to uh, Professor Leah Rodriguez de la Vega. Okay, thank you. Thoughts. Thank you very much for the invitation. Just to add to what already uh, Jerónimo Delgado said, having a general secretary uh, of ALADA national sections in different countries allows us to consider local problems uh, in relation to Asia, to deepen the study of Asia in Spanish. For us, it's very important to have, for example, the translation to direct Asian languages into Spanish. This is one of our big points. And we also have important efforts from different colleagues in the direction of contacting Asia directly. Of course, we have personal networks, but for example, I would like to, to point out the high-level academic dialogue forum, Latin America and the Caribbean, Southeast Asia, recently organized uh, together with ALADA and uh, La Plata National University in Argentina with the collaboration of some cultural Argentine, Philippine, Argentine, Vietnamese, Argentine, Indonesian centers, uh, just to consider another social actors. Uh, concerning the second questions, we think that engaging with Asia helps us to get closer to Asia and not work on an imaginary Asia only, you know, stressing the need to access the knowledge of Asian languages again related to the areas of our studies. We think this is very important. Sometimes uh, when we talk with colleagues from Asia, um, we are not sure what uh, Latin America they are working on. And I imagine they have the same impression in some moments. And finally, to the third question, regarding the interaction to people to people and network to network, we believe it is necessary to maintain regular meetings and network to network and people to people and also include interaction with some other social actor, as Philip said, such as NGOs. We have different experiences in international conferences. As in 2013, we have special sections, uh, changing ideas with local NGOs. I think it was really interesting for us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Rodriguez de la Vega. I think you know, uh, the importance of language and language study for for Asian studies. So, um, finally, we have uh, Dr. Silvia Vignato of the European Association for Southeast Asian Studies. Yes, hi everybody. Um, so um, I will try to be um, to, to be a little bit to go beyond what has been said, uh, which was uh, very interesting. It's I, I'm really happy that. Uh, you put this this program together because actually um, I discover lots of organizations which I was not aware of while others of course um, I have already met and, and uh, attended. So the EUROCES, the European Association for Southeast Asian Studies um, is, um, is an association so it's got members and it's an academic association. So basically, uh, we have different constituencies in, in different parts of Europe, which also reflect the different interests that different countries, of course, on a colonial um, heritage have for, for Southeast Asia and Asia, but we are specifically for Southeast Asia. So we have enormous constituencies uh, and lots of scholars in, of course, uh, like Philippe um, uh, said earlier, in, in, in the Netherlands, in France, in Germany, and, uh, well, in our uh, former European, but still uh, culturally European uh, member, England, and far less um, members in countries like mine, like Italy or, or Spain, um, our constituency, for example, is called Italy and Greece, but the Greek have disappeared from, from the scene. Mm -hmm. So um, what is the importance of this association? Is to network within Europe for uh, there are important centers, but there are lots of um, either isolated researchers in, I don't know, a, uni a large university and they have carried out research here and there in Southeast Asia, but there's no local contact. So it's a very important 
uh, for, for local students. It's very important because it opens possibilities for people to do further networking, especially as far as job hunting is concerned, and research project hunting as well. Uh, now, of course, um, the um, association holds um, uh, um, has a very strict collaboration with Asian um, Southeast Asian institutions as well, but we are not an institutional organization. So virtually we are uh, all members. We have, there's no institution which is members with us. We don't have any funding, which is um, uh, beyond the, the membership fees. Uh, we hold large conferences and we are happy to say that we had a hybrid, but uh, in presence conference in the Czech Republic in Olomouc, earlier this um, this fall, uh, which was very, very, I mean, uh, even moving the first time after two years that we could actually meet in person. But it must be emphasized that most of the members of the association haven't set their foot in Asia for two or more years. So um, we are uh, at a very strange point in, in our identity process, as well as in our relationship with Asia, because for the moment, we don't know what is happening with Asia. So let me move um, to um, the last part of, um, let's say, the scope of this meeting. Um, we have um, a relational problem with states and with other institutions. Uh, the, the networking for us in this moment means to try to enable um, exchanges on, in both ways, but um, many countries, we just can't go, we don't get a visa to go there, mm -hmm. so it's not possible, uh, and vice versa, so we wanted to invite people from Southeast Asia, but we can't for the moment unless people undergo long quarantine and mm, tests and, and you name it. So it's particularly important to re restore, to rebuild, um, uh, strengthening uh, networking in the next few years. Uh, we have uh, actually students who have undergone their training on Southeast Asia and never set their foot in Southeast Asia. They have studied Southeast Asian languages, but they have never spoken them outside the local networks. So it is incredibly important right now that we network with say, so, uh, Asia, Southeast Asian, with Southeast Asian anything, association, institutions, local NGOs and um, cultural association. I was thrilled to, to hear that uh, some of the representatives of the associations uh, in this meeting are uh, from the music sectors. It's fantastic, uh, but this needs to be promoted. Now, of course, needs to be promoted means also needs to be funded. The EURCES, as I said, is an association, it's an institution, but uh, it's good that information about how a young musician can travel, for example, can take part of a nation or vice versa, of a European local program. I'm not talking of big institutions of getting to, for example, conservatories or um, similar, but local institution. There are few, I have thought, I'm thinking of a few students who ended up in very interesting local places and they came out with very interesting material. Um, so agreements, um, institu small institution to small institution agreements are often a fantastic way for people to meet. Sometimes it needs a student here and a student there and something new and interesting uh, is, is born, which I mean, of course I could never think of, but many people couldn't think of. So um, for example, facilitating who is willing to do something with a um, small university in, in East France or in Northern Italy or in the Czech Republic. This is an important, um, and it's also very important as um, 
uh, Brendan Howe said, there is an epistemological strength in this kind of um, crisscrossing the local at all levels in Europe, both in Europe and in Asia, because um, although we are studying Southeast Asia and that is our main focus and why we are together, but localities are everywhere. So, um, and localities are not that local often. Um, we have a student, a PhD student from Senegal who is studying um, Bengala. This is extremely fertile. Um, so I don't want to keep it too long. This is what I had to say on the matter. Yes, and um, very informative and um, I've, I've learned a lot. But um, we have uh, Hilary Fincham um, who just uh, came in and, and we're fortunate to have her today. Uh, Hilary, can you tell us uh, your thoughts on, on the first uh, set of questions? Yeah, apologies for um, for coming in late. I, I didn't receive that first link. I found it in my, I did, but it, it landed in my junk folder. So I was definitely Sorry. looking for the initial. It's okay. I just, sometimes that happens. So um, on, are you, are you asking about the organization well, profile regarding? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, well, I mean, the AAS has been around for a really long time. So I'm representing the Association for Asian Studies. Um, we're a North America based um, organization. And we've been around since 1941. Um, so initially, we started as a publication called the Far Eastern Quarterly. Um, and uh, we've developed over the years into uh, a membership organization, uh, essentially representing Asian studies, or the main uh, uh, organization representing Asian studies in North America, particularly the United States and Canada. Um, and uh, we expand it to include representation in the 70s, um, different area councils. So again, um, one of the things that uh, we have kind of continued to do over the years is kind of stick with US government 1940s uh, divisions, geopolitical divisions of Asia, Southeast Asia, Northeast Asia, <laughs> et cetera. Um, and and we, it's a conversation that we're, we have these days about maybe changing those paradigms, but uh, we have area councils that represent um, different regions of Asia, and uh, one of our main kind of uh, ways of gathering or connecting scholars of Asia all over the world is through our international conference, which takes place um, every year. Um, it always typically takes place uh, in North America. So about a decade ago, we instituted a conference called um, AAS in Asia, um, which takes place actually outside of North America, obviously. Um, we've had conferences in Bangkok, in Korea, uh, in um, Japan, in Japan, um, uh, and uh, in uh, Singapore. Um, so we really are working very hard to uh, build connections outside of this kind of uh, pretty regional North America um, uh, network. And I, I, we believe that that's absolutely crucial. I mean, as an Asian studies organization, um, I think the paradigm for North American uh, academia. And please tell me if I'm rambling on way too much. Um, but the paradigm for North American academia uh, for a long time has really been centered on North American style of um, writing, North American style of research, North American style of presentation, <laughs> North American networks. And um, over the past few years, um, the Association for Asian Studies has been working very hard to, to kind of to, to expand and to really stop only looking inward and really kind of focusing outward. It's been sort of an ironic uh, organizational profile where um, we need to really kind of expand and open ourselves up to different ways of doing research and to really network with scholars out, you know, in many parts of Asia and in Europe and throughout the world. So this is a great opportunity uh, to, to be a part of this uh round table and I, I think that part of part of that is also in addition to having conferences in um, outside of north america um in asia uh really building collaborative networks with scholars um publications um and uh also round tables like this um workshops um in which people engage and learn from each other um across uh, regional and international borders those are all really crucial uh, methods, ways of connecting um, with each other internationally. So, um, 
Those are my thoughts on those initial questions. Yes, uh, thanks, Hilary. Um, so we are supposed to have a, a brief no, um, gap between the questions. If you, among the panelists, if you have questions or clarifications that you want to um, even ask your fellow panelists, then this is the time. If there is none, I think we can go to perhaps a more interesting part of, of the round table uh, on the issues and challenges. So let me read the question. Uh, what economic and political factors do you think uh, could decisively shape how we study and understand Asia? What are the most important issues that Asian studies scholars um, should pursue and why? Okay, um, anyone who wants to begin? Well, I've just seen uh, in the Q&A, uh, there's a question related to actually the issues and trends question that you have just asked us. Uh, so maybe I can speak from a, an APISA perspective on what we think are the most important issues that Asian scholars should pursue. But remember, even though we're very broadly defining political and international studies at APISA, we are still primarily political and international studies. So uh, we may miss some of the important themes from other discourses. But first of all, the, as I already mentioned, the, the notion of distinct epistemological communities in the region, of the region, and across disciplines and across boundaries. Uh, I think that this is a a really important area of research uh, and communication uh, at the moment in Asian studies. Secondly, the, the possibility of regional cooperation in the age of great power global competition and linked to this, the, the rise of non-traditional challenges to governance uh, and to security. So of course, COVID-19, but the other two great challenges of the time, I would say, uh, the climate crisis, in, including transnational pollution in this region. So we, we have very bad uh, transnational pollution in Northeast Asia that we, we call yellow dust. And in Southeast Asia, of course, haze. And in South Asia, of course, you have eight of the 10 most uh, air polluted cities in the world at the last count. So, uh, these issues, uh, I think, are incredibly important. And the third issue uh, is the uh, forced migration and refugees crisis, uh, which has always been important in this region, uh, and I think is only going to get more important uh, as we're dealing with the fallout of the Afghan crisis, uh, but also Yemen refugees, uh, of course, we already had the Rohingya and the North Korean refugees, uh, but now we have other refugees from the conflict in Myanmar. So I, I think these are the three uh, subject issues that, that we're dealing with in particular. Uh, in terms of economic and political factors, uh, I think uh, shaping, yeah, decisively shaping how we understand Asia. First of all, I think that we're going to face a transition in our understanding of economic relations in this region uh, from a focus on what's been called a conophoria, where macroeconomic development is, is sought as a panacea, a solution to all the governance problems, whether international governance or domestic governance. So a shift from that to concerns of distributive justice, uh, especially as we see such a dramatic rise in inequality across the region, uh, especially in Northeast Asia, actually. Now, Korea, for instance, South Korea developed relatively equitably, uh, certainly compared with Western models, until the Asian financial crisis, when the IMF dictated to Korea that Korea had to adopt neoliberal economic reforms immediately after which we've had a tremendous explosion of inequality in Korea. So I think this is gonna be a very important question going forward 
economically. Uh, politically, the, the rise of middle power activism or second tier activism uh, in the face of the great power stalemate or great power competition, uh, but also the empowerment of civil society by the information and communication technology revolution for both good and bad. I mean, if, if you look at the Rohingya ethnic cleansing and, and potential genocide, a lot of this was provoked by civil society engagement through Facebook. So whilst it, there are many positives to having these new preachers of civil society, uh, new activists uh, challenging authoritarian state structures in the region, uh, I think that we also have to be careful in recognizing the, the dangers they pose for hu human well-being as well. Yes, uh, thanks, Brendan. So um, some of the things you mentioned is uh, environment, climate, refugee crisis, migrant crisis, also rising inequality, um, the middle power uh, versus uh, great, uh, great power competition. I wonder what other uh, speakers think uh, about the, you know, the primacy, the, the, the importance of, of these issues for um, Asian studies? Well, if, if I can pick it up. Yes, uh, sure, uh, Sylvia. Yeah, sorry. Um, well, I had, um, in preparation for this, for this meeting, I had also made a list. And of course, um, what Brandon has just underlined is the, the, the climate change is the key issue for everybody in the world, not only for Asia. So we're all in it and um, we're all differently in it. And that is the one of the key issues. Um, in, if I have to speak from within the association, we see that there is a lot of concern and a lot of studying which is carried out about that. But uh, I won't go on. And of course, the, uh, the political crisis, which um, is depending. But I would like to stress two different um, stream of research, which are not, in my opinion, and in other people's opinion, not yet um, sufficiently developed. And they are interconnected. Uh, and they concern systems of care. Um, and of course, this has appeared as particularly relevant in the light of the pandemics. But systems of, cares, of care uh, are a big, big, big issue um, for most countries uh, where it's been given for granted that they would go on by themselves traditionally. Uh, and it's not no longer like that. There's very little studying which has been carried out on uh, national systems of care and uh, the articulation of um, national systems with local systems, whatever local means. Furthermore, the other um, cultural, social, and also um, economic issue concerns demography. Uh, demography is understudied, uh, is under symbolized. So, uh, what um, what social goes into um, strategies or non-strategies of demography are um, quite unknown for the moment. Um, it, so, demography needs a cultural approach, whereas it's been left to uh, traditional demographic studies, counting up people. Um, and I don't want to, I mean, there are very interesting matters, but it's been, uh, it's coming up uh, within the European studies, and I think it's an important item in the agenda. And last, of course, um, there's this um, um, migrations and refugees have been mentioned, but uh, what does mobility do to um, lo local societies? Uh, in the long run, we have sort of sorted out what's happening, but in the long run, uh, I think that the Philippine studies have, are the only one because of the long-term structure with the Indian diaspora, but the Philippine studies are developing this in a very, very, very interesting ways. So this, I think, um, 
one of the last thing I would like to underline. There are a few um, issues which are um, coming up as, as uh, determining most uh, local policies and uh, they are connected. And one is the illegality and criminality in Southeast Asia, especially related to drugs. And of course, there are many examples, I won't take them out. Um, and that relates to uh, prison societies. Um, this is an enormous issue everywhere, but it's an enormous and political issue in many, in most Southeast Asian countries, I would like to say all. Um, so that's not to, to contrast, but to complete and not to repeat what has already been said. Yes, uh, thanks, Sylvia. So uh, you mentioned systems of care, mobility, uh, criminality, uh, and illegality. Uh, to continue the discussion, I think Philip, I, I saw Philip uh, hand um, race and then Hieronimo and then Leah. Uh, thank you, Ariel. Yeah, I would just like to uh, go uh, carry on, on on this list of things but one th beyond beyond list of topics one to me uh, big one which is a bit the elephant in the room is our, our own role as scholars uh, humanistic scholars because i still see uh, what we call area studies as part very much of of humanistic uh, intellectual, um, uh, you know, approach uh, uh, which which recognizes the the uh, local context, local cultural and uh, um, uh, identity and, and integrity of, of of different societies. And 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 in, in now with with the pandemic, we have seen uh, so much, uh, you know, um, that we upon which we worked that has been shaken. I mean, the fact that, of course, we can't travel, we cannot meet. But beyond that, there's also, I think, also the, the question of the role of the university and the, 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 stat, the, the status of the university within society. Uh, we, we are in a period in which uh, uh, what we call populist uh, leaders are, are very much fueling a, a kind of, some kind of anti-knowledge, anti anti-intellectual culture. And 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 uh, and they are carving out larger and larger uh, spaces in in the political discourse. So, uh, to me, there is a lot to be done in terms of uh, self-reflection as as individual scholars, but beyond that, also as as citizens, and 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 uh, within and beyond our institutions. So, uh, yeah, it sounds very broad, but I think uh, questioning now the the modes of funding uh, for scholarship, questioning um, a number a, a vast array of often arbitrary uh, rules. Uh, that are slowly, slowly imped, impeding on our capacity to engage uh, intellectually and, and socially as civic agent is to me uh, a, a, big, a big, big concern. So, um, and, and that connects to what was discussed in, in the first session, I think, in terms of why it is important for us to, to meet, to interact, to engage. It's, be, it's, it's not just about uh, um, pure knowledge, generation but it is also of being part of the same uh, we are on the same planet and and how to engage uh, 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 yeah as civic uh, citizen scholars so yeah this is a very broad point but I just want to mention that we are we can't es escape our political uh, civic role in in society thanks Philip for um, emphasizing the well, self self reflection, um, examining the positionality of, of individual scholars. Uh, Hieronimo, and then Leah and Professor Shah. Thank you, Ariel. Um, I think that question of the most important issues uh, that Asian studies scholars should pursue and why is quite problematic, because I think there are two two factors that you need to take into account. Number one would be where you're working from. And that actually determines what topics of interest, what your topics of interest are. For us in Latin America, the topics of interest might be completely different from, from what you guys are doing in the US or Europe or even Asia. And number two would be what your association organizations 
aim actually is. Uh, Brendan was talking about his organization as being political science and international relations. We at Alada are actually a bit more broad. And of course we started with, with IR, international relations, uh, but then we've gone into culture, we've gone into the environment. We have uh, uh, academics working on cultural studies, things like that. So that's, that's quite problematic. However, for us in Latin America, I think one of the key issues would be um, pretty much uh, how to engage, how to relate these two regions for, for us in Latin America it's quite problematic, especially for some particular countries, it's quite problematic to actually get close to Asia. Um, you have countries such as Cuba or Brazil or even Mexico or Chile who have had a long standing relationship with Asia and therefore this, this um, research on, on foreign policy, commercial uh, trade policy, things like that actually flows. But then um, there are other countries where Asia pretty much hasn't existed in our foreign policy for a while. So in that order of ideas, um, we've got for these countries, um, strengthening that relationship might be actually the key issue. Um, and then um, from there, there's another issue that for us is quite important. And it's the fact that we are working from a region that is so completely different from Asia. Um, there's actually a very, a, a huge cultural historic language wall between Latin America and Asia. So for us, um, you talk about political and economic topics. Of course they are important, but for us, there is also a cultural issue within those economic and, and, and political topics because for many of us, Asia is not easy to understand. And we need to understand them first in order to be able to work with them and study them. So that requires a lot of pre-effort in order to start actually working on research. So that's what I said, that's why I said it's it's quite a problematic um, question because it you, you need to take into account very a, a lot of variables in order to actually answer it. Thank you. Thanks, Veronimo. Uh, we go to Leah. Yeah, um, again, adding to what my colleagues said, I think maybe um, a new field of study, new <laughs> is a way to say, quality of life would be a fantastic addition, um, especially because uh, some Asian countries are projecting themselves in the international arena through these subjects, specifically um, I think of the happiness, national gross product of Bhutan, the international yoga from India, the um, a specific ministry India has on traditional medicines and all that. I think that's a, a very big um, space for research that would be very interesting. And then as Geronimo said, uh, cultural and power dynamics in general related to economy related to international relations and all that. Um, why? Because uh, culture has um, inside this consideration about power and the stratification of society. And, all, and I, I think that's very interesting to, to recover, especially considering, again, the conceptual categories Asian researchers are using, I mean, the local categorical um, conceptual um, categories they are using. I think that's important and not imposing our theoretical uh, framework, uh, the one that we use, and that's very, very important. And besides that, uh, I agree with Philip in the need to articulate this um, production of knowledge with the condition of citizen. You know, we have a specific uh, space of real agency producing knowledge as being citizens at the same time. You know, in that sense, knowledge is not neutral and we have to be aware of that. Um, and finally, there's a need to articulate different historical moments we choose to understand and to study and do research about 
on different uh, Asian countries, because sometimes everybody is working on its own subject, and we have to articulate that more and better to have a better understanding, not only of the present, but also of the future of Asia and our own image about Asia. Thank you. Thanks, Lia. Um, you mentioned several good points. Maybe you can return to that later. Uh, Professor Shao. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the uh, when I uh, when we established the C Asia, I think one of the uh, knowledge production purposes is to advance the quality of Southeast Asian studies in Asia. So that means how the research can advance the, the, our understanding of Southeast Asia as a discipline, as a subdiscipline, uh, as an area studies. So I think the uh, uh, I think the important issue in, in terms of a knowledge production is to have a dialogue between the sub areas of Northeast Asia, uh, talk to Southeast Asia about Southeast Asia, and then Southeast Asia talk to Northeast Asia about Northeast Asia. I think that's very important, rather than just individual scholar presenting paper in any other con conferences. I think that's one of the thing I think as a group about among us, we should also consider the overall quality of a discipline, quality of, of the Southeast Asian studies. Now, in terms of the political economic factors, I think I, I want to, I agree all with, uh, with the pre, uh, previous uh, uh, speakers about the various issues. Uh, I would like to highlight just three. I think some of them are actually overlap with the, the previous discussed. One is that the declining of democracy and the rise of a populism in Asia. And I think that that the issue affect the citizenship protection, affect the, 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 the viability of a civil society and the freedom of speech and so, and journalism, the, 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 the independence of journalism. The second is the remaining, still prevailing economic inequalities. And I will just pinpoint one under the pandemic crisis, I think that we should pay more attention about the future job situation, employment problems and unemployment issue of youth in Asia, in Southeast Asia in particular too. Number three is ethnic because Asia is a, is, is a, is a, is a very, it's a very ethnic diverse region. So therefore, we still face a ethnic discrimination, ethnic mistreatment, and those are things. So we should uh, pay attention to study. Uh, so those are the three issues I think we should pay attention to study, not only individually, but I think collectively. I think they're very important. The last thing I want to focus, rather than the political e economic topic for study, but the economic and political factors affecting our look, our way of doing Asian studies. In a undemocratic or less democratic society, it's very hard to study anyway. So don't mention about Asian studies or Southeast Asian studies. In a poor country, it's, you don't have the resources to, to conduct academic discipline. So therefore, those things it's it's a it's a it's a broader e issue. I think so. That's um, I think the number the, the question three the the, the the UP Asian Center we raised the question how we can improve this. I think that I will I will uh, propose some of the some of the possible uh, solutions, not solutions, some alternatives for us to think about it in, in the question three. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shaw. We look forward to your thoughts on, on uh, moving forward. Um, I wonder whether there are still um, contributions on what you think about, you know, the issues and trends, uh, the challenges. Uh, Hillary. Okay, thank you. Um, I uh, 
I mean, there have been so many great ideas um, put forth. Um, I don't want to repeat anything that anybody has said. Um, I do want to comment Asian studies is multidisciplinary, right? So um, depend, you know, and others have, have mentioned this as well. Hieronimo mentioned that what you study and how you study depends on where you live and um, what is your discipline or perhaps related field of study in addition to your work on, um, on Asia. Um, so I think, uh, the kinds of research that we do or that we should do sort of depends on who you are. I mean, I, I'm an ethnomusicologist, so I study musical culture in Korea. Um, um, and at the same time, I will say that across the board, and this is what others have said, and this is kind of echoing what Philippe had said earlier, he said um, that we cannot escape our civil and political role in society. And so that actual, that role has expanded beyond our, our current kind of, uh, physical surroundings you know what i'm saying um i'm i'm here joining from ann arbor michigan um so what i do as a scholar is it necess um is is it, i'm not only kind of responsible to this this academic and cultural context but also to a more global um uh, social um economic and uh academic context um so that being said i mean i see that there are some issues um, again others have mentioned economic disparities i won't repeat that but i do think that there have been complications obviously we're calling I'm, I'm connecting with you all from all different parts of the world and this is amazing right you know a couple of years ago we didn't even envision doing these kinds of things regularly and we do it all the day every day now it's, a, it's absolutely fabulous but it's also very complicated um, so uh, there, there's the immediacy of Twitter, there's the immediacy of, of Facebook, for example, and so a lot of scholars, young scholars in particular, are putting themselves and their research out there. And so one of the things that um, we've realized as we kind of look at ourselves as Asian studies scholars is like when we put our research out into the global sphere, we also have to be prepared for immediate reactions and interactions from people living in other parts of the world who might have very different perspectives and very different ideas about what that research means and the impact of our research. So um, I think this new sense of responsibility uh, for all scholars, because of the social and cultural context in which we live, um, has really impacted the way that we look at our research. I see um, across the board, no matter your discipline, you know, that research is becoming a lot more socially engaged, a lot more, people are a lot more cognizant of the impact of their words and the type of research that they do. And if they're not, then they're relatively tone deaf. So I think a lot of people are, um, are, or automatically becoming an academic or being an academic doing this kind of research, you cannot escape the political and economic realities of the of the area in which you do your research, um, but also um, in connection and networks with other scholars um, in Asia and across the globe. So um, that is hopefully a unique contribution to this conversation, but this is really in interesting stuff. Thank you. Certainly, certainly. Um, Brendan. Thank you. Sorry to come back again, but uh, just a, a couple of points I wanted to follow up on. Uh, first of all, we're international studies, not international relations. So we do actually include a, a lot of cultural and development studies, uh, as well as democratization and things like that. Uh, and in fact, we're halfway through our, our current Congress. And the first panel this morning was chaired by an ethnomusicologist uh, studying Pan Sori, uh, so Korean, but she's actually American as well, Heather Willoughby. I don't know if you, you know of Heather, but uh, so we certainly do also in, embrace ethnomusicology uh, in the Asian Political and International Studies Association. Oh, that's good to know, Brendan. Um, Professor Chan. Yes, well, that's wonderful to hear as a fellow musician. I'm pleased to hear about that overlap. But I just wanted to add, especially with regard to uh, Dr. Delgado and Dr. Shao regarding the underst understanding Asia and addressing issues, um, we must also ask ourselves, what is meant by Asia, right? Because what is Asia? We have, there are different systems, there are different people, there are different cultures in which everybody has alluded to. And I think that is very important for us to, to realize. And so, uh, when talking about this topic, we must remind ourselves that Asia is never in isolation. And of course, we know that it's, it's, there's the rest of the world, the um, global inter, international dimensions that, that must uh, be uh, 
considered, especially when we're talking about in these days, especially peaceful coexistence is a very, um, that has not yet been mentioned so much, but it's certainly implied as well as the sustainability issues. And I don't mean sustainability only in terms of environment, but of course uh, it has to do with balance of power, such as the political, uh, economic, uh, military, as well as the cultural considerations, which you've been talking about, which I'm very pleased to hear about too. So, you know, um, I'm considered an Asian America, an Asian, an Asian American. So I'm in the US, Asians are uh, a minority. But there is tremendous potential in Asia um, on the global stage, as you may already be well aware of this, that Asians make up the majority of the world's population. So indeed, that is tremendous potential, especially if we work together. And so for, for me, it's, it's again, echoing many of you already, but it's a movement away from the past individual competition to mutual collaboration. So we're working collectively for productivity together. So I just want to uh, reiterate some of the, the points that have been made and just uh, just just mention that because, um, you know, we are talking about the largest area in the world and um, essentially um, uh, it does affect world politics and uh, certainly appreciating the complexities that we, we have uh, within this. Um, yeah, so so thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Professor Chan, Angeline. Uh, I wonder whether anyone would like to add more to the discussion. If not, we go to the third and last part. Um, yeah, well, so, some of these issues, you know, the questions have been, um, some of you have already touched on this, but uh, perhaps you could add more. What are the challenges faced by um, organizations especially regarding issues of funding, membership numbers, job opportunities, considering you know, the ongoing pandemic, how should we respond to these challenges? And, and perhaps more interesting is what areas of collaboration do you suggest to address these challenges? Uh, yes, Brendan. Uh, we we may be somewhat unique, or not quite unique, but in the minority here in that being an Asian-based association, uh, we have particular funding challenges that a lot of our members, for instance, cannot pay membership fees uh, or cannot attend conferences unless we find funding for them. Uh, linked with this, however, is because Asia is seen as such a dynamic developing or developed part of the world that international funding sometimes gets turned off. So APISA was set up with funding from the Swedish International Development Association, uh, Agency. And then they decided to cut the funding for APISA, but continue to fund less developed parts of the, the world in terms of their academic associations. So it's been a, a real major challenge for us to, to get the funding, uh, especially when any funding body tends not to want an open-ended uh, situation where they fund, for instance, a website or administrative staff or so on. Uh, they're, they're much more keen to fund uh, a dinner or, if you're lucky, a whole conference or maybe the the tickets for graduate students to come and present at the conference. So we have tended to rely, since the withdrawal of CEDA funding, we've relied on ad hoc support uh, from funding agencies, the good, good offices of certain key individuals give, giving up their time for free. Um, we've encouraged our, our universities and colleagues to include support for regional conferences and publications in their research funding applications. Uh, but it, it's very much a seat of the pants effort. Uh, and it's very difficult to, to move beyond that. Uh, I, I understand that it, it may be a, a different situation for uh, Asian studies organizations based in, in regions of the world that maybe have more direct access or more sustainable access to funding. But certainly this is the, 
the biggest challenge I think we face uh, as we can, we also try to have our conferences held in lots of different countries in Asia. So I think we are the first major academic conference to uh, be hosted in Cambodia. Uh, we only managed to do that because we actually got funding from the Korean government to, to host a, a conference in Cambodia. So we're looking to, to get money from the, the Koreans and the Japanese, the Japan Foundation, the Korea Foundation, uh, but anywhere we can really. The, the German Stiftung have been helping out with publication costs, uh, but they, they again will not have an open-ended commitment to, for instance, supporting our journal. So in terms of, of collaboration to address these challenges, what we have been doing is, is working on joint conferences, joint publications, uh, looking at exchange relations whereby uh, maybe a panel from a PISA gets to register and present at a, an international conference. We have a panel at the British International Studies Association, for instance. Uh, in the past, the British Political Science Association has invited us to send a, a panel uh, who register for either subsidized or free. Um, and certainly we, we look to cooperate as much as possible. And I think this is the way forward for all these different Asian studies associations to, to look at ways in which we can support panels from each other's conferences uh, or each other's association to, to come together and share knowledge and experience uh, through facilitating collaboration. Yes, um, thanks, Brendan. Uh, Philip, Sylvia, and I think I saw Michael's hand face earlier. So Philip first. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I will follow a bit on what Brendan was just um, mentioning at the end mm -hmm. is since we are, I mean, I, I would like first to commend uh, the Asia Center to organize this talk because it's a good opportunity for us all who are running somehow facilitating networks, large or, or regional or global, whatever, uh, to, to, to be able to, to uh, get to know each other, unfortunately, online only, but it's already good. And, and to uh, maybe to reflect on our responsibilities and our capacities to really be on. Of course, it's good if we can help each other, if we can, we can invite each other, we can, but beyond that to also reflect on on this, this um, uh, again, this this res responsibility that we have, maybe to to um, to uh, bring up to the public discourse agenda a number of topics that are lined in in the list of in the first question uh, related to uh, funding, membership uh, membership numbers, job opportunities, which are. And the, the impact of the pandemic, for instance, we are all affected and everywhere in, uh, across the, the world and in, uh, not just in Asia. And, and to what we in our discussions, for instance, can be more proactive in terms of questioning uh, the, 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 the modes of funding, for instance, not just the problem of finding funders, but who decides and how and why and and uh, because for instance we in ICAS 2019 I mean the, the ICAS 11 that we had in in um, in, in Leiden we organized together with a num number of partners uh, a roundtable on institutional support mm -hmm. and it was interesting because we tried to bring together people from the EU from the US from uh, from private the private foundation world from the from public uh, national agencies, etc., to to discuss with a number of of, of us of, of institutions or, or individual scholars uh, how things work, and it was quite striking to see how um, there is a lack of of thinking at, at at the meta institutional level when it comes to supporting area studies, and we were caught in some discussions that sometimes sounded a bit surreal, you know, like. Uh, unless, uh, for instance, we had the guy from the EU was saying, unless uh, EU develops its own 
um, international, uh, uh, how do you say, um, uh, relation and also the defense policy, then otherwise we will not be very interested in supporting area studies. I mean, this is kind of a bit gross, but it was clear, at least we understood where it was coming from. And, and I think if in our own different uh, framework, I know from the AAS, I, I've been regularly going to AAS, um, I know there are spaces for librarians, that space, but maybe we should think more about opening spaces for, uh, you know, institutional funding. I mean, this being a bit more proactive. I mean, uh, we, we had also in the last ICAS and the previous one also a space for academic freedom. And, and it was not just about uh, the dictatorships, uh, the, the bad guys, and there are many on, we know in Europe, in Asia, in, in Latin America and everywhere. But it was also about even in the so-called established uh, open so-called democratic societies that there are restrictions increasingly uh, to uh, the way uh, uh, scholars, individual, um, again, as citizens can really uh, engage uh, uh, intellectually and just for fear of not finding jobs or not being hired. I mean, these are really increasingly concrete issues. And I don't know for you, but for us, we see more and more we have fellows who are in fact going from one fellowship to another because they can't find jobs. So uh, there's a real problem now. And, and we as network platform facilitators, I think we have a responsibility to maybe think uh, even more proactively. Sorry, I don't wanna politicize everything, but I think at the moment, this, when you have Trump elected, when you have Bolsonaro and so on, we know we have to, to do more than what we used to do. I think that's my opinion and it. Anyway. I agree with you, Philip. Um, Sylvia. Yeah, so, um, well, I basically agree with what has been said and, but I would like to um, emphasize one a consequence of the pandemics on the European funding agenda. Um, as Philip was saying, the area study, but particularly Southeast Asia, has been completely erased. There's no trace of it. Um, and as a consequence, this has influenced um, local, I mean, local uh, national agendas. So with the exception of Germany and the Netherlands, who have a very massive engagement into funding research, much higher than the rest of Europe, particularly higher than Italy, but it doesn't matter, higher than the rest of Europe. But apart from these two countries, uh, European policies are very um, influential towards national politics in research uh, priorities, in setting research priorities. And uh, themes have been uh, developed so when I say themes, I mean, for example, the way you react to pandemics, that's the, the there's masses of fundings on that. Uh, but uh, the fact that area is no longer um, problematized and seen as um, a meaningful, uh, a meaningful topic, a meaningful, um, a different way to see, to look at different themes. Uh, this cannot be, this will not go through. So we have a problem as an association because we are, we are not influential on the European level. Mm -hmm. And we're not very influential on the national level either, because on the national plan, we are irrelevant. We are, we don't count for anything as Southeast Asian, most of us, I mean, there are exceptions, but in Europe, that is the same. So. This, uh, this is on one hand, and on the other hand, um, humanities have been, are being slaughtered all over the place. Unless you do some kind of marketable humanity, uh, heritage, you name it, tourism, basically. So whatever can be sold, music can be sold, so let's fund some ethnomusicology, which can then be performed uh, within a touristic, and I'm not despising this, I'm saying this is what is happening. Um, so what can probably be pursued from our, on our association side is to be 
more proactive on um, strategic planning, uh, in strategic planning sites. Um, but I don't know how we can do it, if not personally, with personal relationships. Uh, with whoever knows anybody, because the guys from the EU who also we invited at different different sites at the EURCs, for example, the EURCs leads a masterclass, which is very attended, but uh, because it's not translated into that language, into the EU language, it doesn't work. Nobody pays any attention to it. Um, then there's the language thing. Um, the EU would like to have lots of students incoming from the, the uh, Asian, the Southeast Asian uh, countries. They would be thrilled. But most Europe does not teach in English. So students don't want to come, basically. They don't want to go to Italy, to France, to, to Spain, to, to you name it. Because what's the point for them? Uh, so it's, it's complicated. But I do think that um, uh, if we want to enhance the, the opportunities of area-based jobs, we have to be lobbying, in other words, uh, at the higher levels. Because otherwise, we can come up with um, nice uh, NGO level opportunities, which are very volatile. They can be here today and gone tomorrow, like a postdoc. So that is the, the main, um, and um, the other part which should be taken into account is publishing and who holds publishing, um, which is not, not irrelevant for job seeking as well. So basically, if you have to, if you have published in a um, in, in English speaking, so basically US based uh, publishing a university uh, publisher, uh, you are not well qualified to get a job anywhere in Europe. And this is, this is what it is. So, I just wanted to bring this up. Yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, Sylvia, for being very open and, and frank. Uh, Michael, and then Heronimo. I think I saw your uh, hand raised. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think the, um, uh, let me take uh, the C Asia as an example, how to deal with the financial difficulties. Uh, because we are in institutional-based uh, consortium. Therefore, we require the 15 institutions who join the consortium have to have ability to self-finance. And then if the institutions, in the institutions uh, uh, as colleague wanted to join the activities, we will encourage the in respective in, in institution to help them, to finance them. And then for the big conference, the biannual conferences, then we will ask the local organizers uh, working with other organizations who are willing to help together to finance. I think one particular category, as I emphasized earlier, the young scholars. We, we provide uh, funding, uh, travel funding for postdoc, PhD students, and uh, even the junior uh, colleagues. I think those are, we, they, I'm, think, I'm talking about uh, the how to maintain the uh, uh, association or consortium can be financially uh, flexible and financially self self con contained. So this is one of thing um, to take care of. It. Um, the second thing is uh, on the on the challenges. I think there are two kind of challenges we are facing. One is um, uh, the areas, the future of area studies. I think the, in C Asia, we have been discussing, not necessarily develop a, a consensus already. We are trying to develop a, a new kind of um, area studies, which we hope can have a very good fruitful dialogue with the social sciences and humanities disciplines. 
So therefore, we try to advocate these so-called humanities and social science-based or oriented or inspired uh, area study rather than the conventional area studies. So in that case, in that case, I think how to deal with these uh, challenges, uh, we will encourage the collaborative studies, co collaborative uh, uh, research work together between discipline on one topic, on one topic in different countries. I think that's what we are trying to do, but we haven't, we haven't achieved that successfully yet. The other one is, I think, the encourage the, the competitive studies. I think it's very important to have a competitive study and hopefully to improve your home country. I think it's very, in my, my Taiwan experience, I developed a com Taiwan's, uh, uh, my own Southeast Asian study. I always include Taiwan, try to compare Taiwan experience with Southeast Asian experience and therefore trying to co-produce our knowledges. So I think the, the one is a social science based area study should be encouraged. Second, the competitive study include your own country should also be encouraged. And I think that in that case, you know, what can do be, will be do, what will be financially beneficial because in each countries nowadays, social disciplinary funding is much more higher than area studies. If you can say this is a study related to sociology, political science, economics, anthropology, on competitive study, I think you can get funding for travel. If you look at the area studies per se, I think probably more difficult. So that I think that is only not only for um, for intellectual reason, but also practical financial uh, uh, reasons. So I think I will encourage these two kind of uh, uh, area stu uh, area study to be um, encouraged and to be advanced. Thank you. Oh, thanks, um, uh, Professor Michael Shaw. Well, we have Hieronimo and also Dia. Thank you, Ariel. Um, I think it's quite interesting to hear all, our, all my colleagues here because, again, where we are from actually determines how we function. Um, Professor Sylvia was actually talking about how sometimes irrelevant Asian and Southeast Asian studies uh, are in Europe at the moment. Um, what is interesting is that in, in Latin America in particular, Asia is, is a new world to discover. And therefore, uh, since there was not a lot of Asian studies before, and the governments are realizing that a lot of opportunities are coming from Asia, um, there's a growing interest. Of course, it varies from country to country, but there's a growing interest on the region. And governments and institutions are actually looking for knowledge on Asia and students are increasingly interested in, 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 in learning about Asia. That on one side. On the other side, um, one of the topics you, you ask about is funding. And I was actually talking to Leah on, on WhatsApp right now and, and I asked her, should we say that you don't actually need money to function? And she said, yes, you, you can say it. And, and we want to make that clear. We, we, we try to have a, a cooperation agreement with an institution in the Netherlands for one of our, of our big congresses. And they started telling us what to do and how to do it. And we sure didn't want that. So um, sometimes ac having access to funding means you lose your independence and you end up doing what they tell you to do and not what you want to do or what you need to do. Um, Alada has existed since 1976. Some of the countries within the association actually pay a fee to be, to be a member of the association. Some don't, most don't. And what we do is we have a very strong um, collaboration system with institutions. So wherever we, whenever we're going to have one of our, of our big congresses, we have a very strong relationship with the, with the university that is going to hold uh, the, 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 the conference and costs can actually be paid with the fee you pay to go to the conference. And there's a lot of activities you can do 
to, to create networks and to, to enhance Asian studies and African studies in our case that do not need money. And, and in that way, um, I, I want to make it clear, of course, having money is fantastic. And we've had support from the Korea Foundation. We've had support from the Japan Foundation. We've had support for specific panels in our conferences, but um, you don't need money to function. function. And, and that actually has advantages sometimes. And I think that's important. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. Um, sure. The other thing I, I, I wanted to tell you is that we are doing, um, we are starting uh, a program to work with students. And I think this is, this is um, uh, very important. We are trying to, to get students interested in Asian and African studies. And um, therefore we believe that we must, uh, uh, researchers right now, are, some of them are, are very old and we need to replace them sort of. So we need to start um, educating, creating these new scholars that are going to, to follow on the steps of the ones that are uh, working on Asian studies now. So from Alada, we are organizing a huge um, students uh, co uh, conference. It's gonna be online, of course, because of the pandemic. But um, I think that's, that's a very important issue in moving forward, how we can guarantee that the, the, what we've done so far is not going to end once all these people retire, die, or, or whatever. It's, it's important. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thanks, Leah. Uh, thanks, uh, Veronima. Uh, Leah. Yeah, thank you. Um, going back to the political question, many times we rely on the specific collaboration of some of our members uh, we, who sympathize with the situation of other colleagues that have big problems, for example, to go for a, for a Congress. And we collaborate individually, as Geronimo said, sometimes uh, we don't have the funding. Uh, for example, I work on India and South Asia, and I am not uh, in the possibility to ask to a Japanese foundation or a Korean foundation, the colleagues working on those areas, they have these opportunities, I don't. So I, I have to, to think in a different way, how we can collaborate being from these areas to help some other colleagues that are in a worse situation. And we managed to do it. I remember um, a national conference in Cúcuta, in Colombia, where we could manage with Geronimo to help some other colleagues and it was uh, fantastic because we have uh, some other kind of interaction, not only the knowledge, the exposition in the conference, but also the human relationship, you know, uh, and that gave us uh, more agency, I think. And besides that, when we have the opportunity to have some other funding, I think the important thing is that uh, first we have to clarify what are our interests and the interests of the others who can really help us, funding us. I think that's important. And I agree with Geronimo, sometimes we have differences, but I also think that we can go to a point that we have a confluence of interest between people giving uh, the funding and us. And I think that's important. Thank you. We can function without money too. Thank you. Yes, um, okay. And any, anyone else who wants to add? Maybe Hilary or Anjali? Yeah, um, I'll go ahead and speak up if that's all right. Um, so I, I do admire um, a, lot of, um, a lot of statement that they don't need money to survive. We actually do. <laughs> we're, an we're an incorporated organization and we have a staff and we have overhead costs and whatnot. So, you know, it's pretty much money from conferences and money from membership actually help to sustain the organization itself. But more important than that, um, one of the issues that was brought up by Geronimo and others is the pipeline issue. Um, uh, not only is the job market currently problematic uh, worldwide, um, but we also have, we realize that it's very, very important to support the next generation of scholars. So, um, and for us, it's important to get funding to do that. So I, I understand that, that the funding also does tie you to particular restrictions and um, rules, but at the same time, 
we need it to provide support to our members. So um, the funding that we get goes directly into our members um, and also outside of that. So uh, some of the things that we've been working on um, recently is uh, in order to figure out how to better sustain our organization, I'd like to see the AAS and all of these organizations around in you know, 30, 50, 100 years, right? Um, um, because we originally became organizations as a, as a medium, as, a, as the connective tissue, so to speak, for our um, field of study. Um, it allowed people to connect um, via the national conference. You know, while we connect uh, through the internet these days, that's a new way of connecting, we still have discovered we're currently in the middle of a strategic planning process. Um, we've, we've discovered that still most people see the conference and the physical gathering or the kind of this kind of gathering as really important uh, to their identity and to um, their work as Asianists. Um, so that's important. Um, so that brings us to a couple of things, uh, supporting the pipeline. So we try to do that via our, our meetings, but also by providing funding uh, providing student support for research or young scholar support for research, um, workshops, uh, publication workshops, um, and uh, mentoring uh, for scholars to prepare them for the job market and prepare them for professional work in the field. And that's an important part of sustainability. Um, but going back to what Philippe had said earlier about the spaces, um, those are really important to create these new spaces for collaboration to figure out ways that we as organizations can really uh, learn from each other, uh, support each other, and strengthen our works so that we can better serve our field of study. And that's the most important thing to kind of keep in mind, you know. We, um, and for every organization, that means something different. Um, and uh, at the same time, we can talk about funding being an issue and a problem around the world. Um, but more importantly, how can we pivot? How can we better respond to the needs of scholars in our fields? And how can we work together to support each other in order to better do that? Um, and I think we're really moving in, in the right direction here um, with this round table. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Hilary. Um, and Jiddy? Yes, I think so many wonderful things have been said. And I want to, especially for our younger scholars, to, to remind you of the opportunity to present your papers, your scholarly work, especially at the IPSA World Congress, which will be in Buenos Aires in 2023. It will be in July. I did put my uh, information in the chat box if you'd like to contact me on that. But um, yes, echoing the joint conference collaborations, pulling together to find creative solutions with or without money. But um, it just comes to mind um, whenever my siblings and I might have a conflict, my mother would say that one chopstick by itself can easily break, but not, not when we're all together. So I think that's it's something to remember, you know, we can be all together. And even though we're sped up geographically, it's wonderful ha to have such an occasion as today to bring us all together for ongoing conversations for th those creative solutions moving forward. So thank you again, Professor Lopez, for, th for this wonderful opportunity at the Asian Center and my wonderful colleagues today. It's been such a great pleasure. Please Thanks. Yes, uh, thanks, Professor Chan. Uh, we have, um, you know, as you know, we have exceeded the original time, but please um, allow us to have a bit of an open forum. Not all questions, of course, will be answered in, in, in some synthesis. So maximum 15 minutes, if that's okay, um, for the panelists and also for the audience. May I call Professor Michel Palumbrit, my colleague at the Asian Center, to uh, will moderate the open forum very quickly. Yes, thank you, Ariel. Uh, we really have an interesting discussion here. If only we have the luxury of time, we can extend this session. But I think the net this is reserved for part two of this webinar, perhaps, you know, in, in the near future. Um, but in the interest of our limited time, um, we uh, also, uh, it's best that we also hear from our participants. Um, we have here a lot of questions from, um, from our participants. Um, but I've looked into the questions in the Q&A box, and I believe many of the questions have already been answered. Okay, um, but there's one interesting question here from Romel Kuraming or Kuraming. Perhaps our speakers can, can, can look into this, but um, uh, nevertheless, I'll read it. So he says, he says here, more and more Asian scholars are specializing in the study of other countries or regions in Asia. And we can say that this will continue until such time 
the Euro-American scholars may no longer enjoy the quote-unquote hegemony we all have been used to. How do you think the rise of the critical mass of Asian home scholars will affect the dynamics within Asian studies community as well as the very nature of area studies? So any of our speakers can um, answer this. A any thoughts on this? I'll go ahead um, and, and yes, try to address please. that. I'm sorry for jumping in uh, without raising my hand. Um, yeah, this goes back to the idea of kind of, you know, the idea of a hegemony, you know, of privileging the voice of um, privileging, first of all, the English language in uh, international academia, um, which in and of itself is problematic. I mean, I, I, I lived and worked in Korea for 10 years and you got boni bonus points for uh, publishing in English, you know, everybody wants to publish in English um, because that's the international language. Um, so we, we have a linguistic hegemony in addition to um, a style of scholarship and a way of approaching research that is also what I would call a hegemony. So um, it, it, it's, it's one of those conversations that everybody is having in every single discipline and field of study, you know, um, decentralizing um, the field um, and determining ways where, whereby we can uh, break away from that paradigm that is sort of solidly kind of directed what we think of as good scholarship and as contribute contributing scholarship over the years. So I, I think opening ourselves to multi-language publications, opening ourselves to um, to really accepting different kinds of scholarship with different foci and different perspectives. And we could all study this chair next to me, right? But we could, this is a really bad example, but we could all look at it from very different angles depending on our own personal histories, experiences and our studies and our training. So um, I think that uh, we're moving in that direction. Um, I think that it is a really difficult kind of hill we are climbing um, in order to, uh, uh, really open ourselves up to um, accepting multiple uh, ways of doing research and expressing ourselves academically. Um, I see the rise of Asian scholars. I, I don't really see that as a, as a current thing. I see this as something that's been a part of, you know, and maybe it's because I lived and worked in Korea for 10 years. It's just like, I don't really see this as like something sudden and new. Um, I do think that the issue really is, um, as, as the, the individual who asked the question said, stated, it's the he kind of a hege hegemony that sort of brainwashed a lot of, um, of academic institutions um, and the idea of what is uh, academia, what is international academics um, in a way that has really restricted our openness to uh, diverse voices. So I think we're moving in that direction, but I, I think that it's going to take time. And it's going to take a lot of collaboration and a lot of openness to language in particular outside of the use of English. So that's my perspective on that. Thank you, Hillary. Very interesting point. Um, I see Professor Xiao's hand raised, please, Professor okay. Xiao. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, it is encouraging trend. And this is a, should be welcomed to have the local scholar to study their local societies in Asia. Uh, I think though this, I have been uh, surveying many, many uh, uh, literatures on the Southeast uh, Asian studies and they all claim they want to be intellectually independent, academically autonomous. But, but that should not be turned into a academic, a academic nationalism. So I think it's a very important between the independence, autonomy versus nationalism. And secondly, I think we are talking about what we need. The trend of a localization, the trend of an indigenization is to, to develop, to produce good research or even better research, not a nationalistic research. So I think I will encourage the dialogue between the local scholars and also the counterpart in the West on the same subject and to compare and to, 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 to develop debate or, or exchange. I think that what should be, should be encouraged. I think that will be interesting for, uh, for the uh, Asian study journals worldwide to open up the pages of sections on this that called dialogue between this and that, A and B, B and C. And I think that will be encouraging. But I think I, for one, I think uh, Asian, Asian scholars study Asian should be encouraged. Fascinating points, uh, Professor Xiao. I, I see uh, Philip's hand raised. Please, Philip. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm just uh, bouncing with what was said before, especially uh, what 
Hillary mentioned, there are many, uh, you know, um, concrete uh, ways to uh, address this north, south, or west, uh, and the rest kind of divide. I mean, uh, for instance, for IPAS, we have these book prices in many languages, and we work with partners from different a number of countries or, or regions using a language that is also important beyond national boundaries. We, we do it in, in Spanish, Portuguese, we do it in, 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 we did in Japanese, Chinese, which is problematic, of course, um, because of the political divide, but um, and, and, and in French, uh, uh, German, except uh, Korean. And, and okay, this is may not, I don't know if it's one, it's one way at least to address it, to acknowledge at least that good scholarship is developed in other languages than English. That's one small thing uh, in which we can we can contribute. But um, beyond these these different um, instruments that we can develop, I think it is important for northern or western or, or North American and European institutions to to work actively into seeking to decentral decenter themselves. And in order to do that, I think um, it's not necessarily always for us to export our model outside to claim that therefore we are we are not just doing it from our own uh, centeredness. But it could be uh, like in the case of this Africa Asia platform that I mentioned, or I think also Latin America Asia, to really directly encourage alternative access of knowledge. That's the term that our African colleagues are using for Africa Asia. So by, de by developing and facilitating um, uh, alternative uh, uh, yeah, uh, routes of, 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 um, of intellectual engagement and inter in, in interaction, it will also help us in the North, uh, um, uh, because by the way, there's North and, uh, North and South, even in the North, it's not all, uh, uh, you know, uh, so simple. But in our own society, um, we are a bit often the victims of our own uh, colonial or Cold War, uh, you know, uh, uh, model of, 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 of domination. And, and we need to encourage our own young scholars to think in, in also in this multi-centered approach. And, and, and for instance, I mean, it is happening, but it's still very difficult, of course, if somebody works, and I think Professor Michael Shaw might mention uh, the importance of comparativeness it is true within Asia and among Asian partners and read different parts of Asia, as Michael mentioned, but it is also true uh, for somebody, if you work on gender issues in, 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 in Korea, you could think also in comparing with, I don't know, with uh, not only other countries in Asia, uh, but also maybe in Africa or Latin America. I mean, to really complexify and, and, and in a way, uh, break down some of those silos, these, these, these vertical silos that are often um, entrapping us. So, I mean, I'm not, uh, but anyway, for, I, I can say that as far as we are concerned at IS, we've learned so much by developing programs that are um, intra and inter-regional, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like this Africa Asia platform or this Humanities Across Borders pro program, whereby we work around some themes that are uh, not even devised artificially from, uh, you know, let's say from the North or, but that, that they are based on very um, uh, um, universal meaning or experienced meaning such as food, for instance, everybody eats regardless of where they're from and around food, how to rebuild connections based on comparison in exchange and also relocalization and situation of, of knowledge production itself. Anyway, I, I, maybe I'm, I'm rambling, but I, I, I think there's a lot of space if we think creatively beyond um, uh, many uh, institutionalized uh, uh, um, uh, boundaries that sometimes uh, untrap us. And, 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 and I think that's why I think this, this meeting is very helpful. And I, I saw on the chat line that uh, many of us would like to continue our discussion. So I think again, thank you at the University of Philippines to put forward this, this, this discussion and we should find ways to continue. Thank you, Philip. Thank you very much. You raised really interesting points uh, here. Um, perhaps we can have one last question, and but this is for all of you. We have here um, a question from Rande Nobleza. Um, he says here, in the spirit of future thinking and foresight, how do you see Asian studies by 2050? Would it be the transdisciplinary or 
more computational, digitized? What are your thoughts on this? <laughs> I, I'm just going to say that I am sure that somebody who's 30 years younger than me is going to be able to address this question far better than I can because 2050 for me is uh, a bit too further. So I, I don't want to, I, I, think, I think this kind of question has to be asked uh, by people who are at least under, mm. I would say 35. I don't know if any of us qualifies for that, certainly the organizers, but unfortunately mm. I certainly don't. So I am um, ask these questions and please give quick an answer to me um, while I still can understand answers. So, okay, uh, Professor Xiao is raising his hand. Okay, I, uh, uh, two th uh, 2050, I won't be here. So uh, there will be 30 years, 30 years from now, there will be 110. And that's uh, too much to ask for. Uh, but I think the, uh, at the, the fading away of a colonialism, the post-colonial legacy, because we know area study basically is a, is a production of a colonialism and the colonial policy. And that has been 60, 70, and 80 still dominant. Now, I think you should move to, as I advocated, disciplinary, competitive, and I think that as a trend to be go should, should should go. I think I expect will be 2050 will be more social science, humanity, disciplinary based competitive area studies. But they now rule out the national study. So there's always a long term debate, long long debate between should we look at the regional study or nation national study. I think it should be balanced. But regardless of regional competitive study or or nation to nation competitive study, I think your discipline is very important. I think more and more uh, uh, social science, uh, the area study program did was actually supported by different departments. So therefore, the department has the job to do to promote the discipline based area studies, Asian studies. Thank you. Right, right. Thank you, Professor Xiao. Um, I, I see Philip very interested, eager to answer this question. Yes, Philip, the, the screen is yours. No, I, I made a mistake with the hand. But anyway, uh, yeah, no, I just would <laughs> like to say that, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the two alternatives that uh, the, the, the person, the question, uh, uh, you know, raised, uh, either computational knowledge or, or or uh, knowledge based on diversity. I mean, obviously it's up to us as, as uh, uh, people who are alive today uh, uh, and raise, who, who, who reign these you know, this, this kind of initiatives like networks and platforms to really make sure, ensure that this, uh, the humanistic and, uh, uh, um, dimension that is embedded, I think, in the knowledge of, and engagement or, or intercultural uh, um, uh, uh, dialogue collaboration uh, can continue, can pursue uh, beyond all the the political and and you know uh, you know aspects. So um, it's up to us to really be at the moment. I think very uh, again what I mentioned earlier, very uh, more proactive and maybe more imaginative when it comes to trying to uh, to uh, to ensure that we are not going to veer towards this. Uh, dystop dystopian uh, 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 world that uh, technology can offer us sometimes. Thank you, Philip, even if you didn't raise your hand, but you answered the question. That's really interesting. And thank you very much for your interesting answer. Um, yeah. I don't want to close this um, Q&A forum without Leia uh, uh, saying her piece as well. Leia, please. That's a few moments. Uh, Sylvia, thank you very much. I think you are going out for girls. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Bye. What I see okay. for Asian studies in the future is more interdisciplinary, uh, Thank you, more humanistic. Bye. I agree with the colleagues. And besides that, I hope the develop of new fields of study as Asian American uh, realities, why not? 
And in the end, I would like to say that Alada is already collaborating with some other institution. I want to say that in public. And thank you very much for Paul, Barden Berden, and Philippe. We are collaborating with ICAS, and we also collaborate with AAS and Professor Prasenjit Dwara, Christine Llano, and now Hilary. Thank you very much to you both and your institution for the starting of this collaboration. Thank you for the organizers. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Leah. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sure um, you would like to say more, but uh, in the interest of time, I think we'll, we'll end our program here. I'll give the screen back to you. Yes, uh, part of our program is a very, very of what we have uh, talked so far. So I'll, I'll call my colleague, Professor Antonia Trakiza. Thank you. Uh, so I uh, thank you so much for that really interesting and, and insightful uh, discussion. So I will try my best to, pro to provide uh, what the key points are as far as the discussion is concerned. Um, so we started with the with the, uh, the organizational profile and what came out in terms of like uh, everybody's presentation is that there are in fact different uh, different organizations. Uh, we have uh, a research committees or committees in uh, in disciplinal or international associations or organizations or networks. So in in the case of uh, uh, Dr. Chang Angelin, it's research committee in a, in a, in a, in a, in a an international uh, IPSA, no international political uh, association. And then we have also like with a PISA networks of net networks, which means that it actually brings together different uh, members from different networks, uh, collaborating and in, in, in discussing in, in, in a specific space. We also have the consortium, which uh, which CHA uh, discussed, or uh, is a model where the members are actually institutions. We have, and then there was also, of course, the incorporated organization that uh, that Hillary mentioned, which is it is in fact a, an institution in itself that is uh, fully fully functional with uh, with a uh, with a with a, a full blown office. So in terms of in terms of you know the organizational structures, we will see that you know organizations with Asian studies are in fact uh, have different forms. In terms of actions um, that were or, or uh, what's in the program, of course, again it is as diverse as Asia itself. Um, the more the more um, the more common is international conferences. Um, we also have uh, so international conference whether it's by biennial or uh, or uh, some sort of regular conferences that sustain communication and uh, and uh, uh, shared learning from the different member organizations and beyond and it also provides a re recruitment actually a recruitment uh, mechanism to increase uh, the membership we also have uh, <clears throat> different types of relationships that have been formed one is of, of course Subregions. So there is the regional. There is a regional network, but there's also um, the subregion. So uh, a, a network in like Alada would have, you know, different uh, Asia uh, would have different subregions, and that would be covered by one, but um, by, by one network. Uh, a, a second one is in fact um, also in terms of a uh, uh, region to region. So what has been discussed and in fact has been put forward is not only in terms of the, and this is I think true with uh, what C Asia mentioned, which is, uh, who knows? so C Asia was thinking about Southeast Asia with South India and Northeast Asia, so on and so forth. So that is in, in fact part of the agenda. But the other thing that has been raised would be region to region, which means Latin America and Southeast Asia. And uh, so that could be in a way up can be a part of the of uh, trying to broaden and reach out and forming collaborative projects. Um, there is, of course, one of the outside the international conferences would be the research uh, collaborative research that is part and parcel of the international conferences, but also in its own. 
um, one of the one of the uh, CA Asia has mentioned is actually to undertake comparative research, um, which allows for or, or you know a cross country, cross sub region type of uh, research uh, that can have you know cost sharing, but also a lot of sharing of ideas. Um, in issues and trends, let me just actually this is a really we have a big uh, list. So I will just run down, but you know, um, and they're all important. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, uh, cluster them. There's of course the regional, regional cooperation, promoting regional cooperation in light of the great power competition. So strategic studies. There's also the more traditional, non-traditional challenges that was uh, mentioned by uh, Brendan, which is of course a pandemic health uh, crisis, but also climate change. Uh, that has become a major source of uh, concern, especially that, especially since it is it affects it goes you know cross border pollution is one of the one of the major uh, problems that we face uh, in especially with urbanization. There's also the question of forced migration and re and, and refugees and others have have jumped in and talked about the question of mobility. We're talking about cross border and and um, cross-border and uh, internal migration. We're also talking about not necessarily forced migration, but also in effect, the mobility that we find again in, in uh, when we're opening borders and, and we have, in a sense, we have you know, people really uh, being much, much more mobile in this, uh, in this space. With regards to economic, um, the economic issues, we have the micro, so, uh, Again, I will start with Brendan because he's, he, he uh, uh, said he started this, which is the shift or at least broadening from the micro sol macroeconomic solutions to distributive justice. And this really talks about you know, Asia being a high growth region, but at the same time, you also have rising inequality. So that was one of the paradox actually of uh, Asia, or particularly Southeast Asia. There's also the rise of, uh, there's also interest in terms of uh, middle power activism. This would be, I guess, in terms of superpower or, uh, or big or great power activism. And activism among civil society organizations and engagement. And this will bring me to uh, Philip's uh, uh, input regarding you know, the role of uh, scholars um, and the and the and the place and status of universities. Um, so there was the question of uh, what is our role as Asianists in, in a region where there is a decline of democracy, there's the rise of populism and authoritarianism. So there is, I guess, a consensus that there is a need to in fact uh, exercise our agency and also uh, develop the civic uh, uh, Asianists or scholars as civic actors, political actors and public intellectuals. Um, Leah came in with the question of quality of life. And this is, in a way, this is basically um, because Asia is rich in traditions, in cultural, uh, non, you know, traditions in terms of healing, in terms of uh, uh, practices that revolves around families and, and communities. So, so uh, th this is one issue or one uh, area that can be uh, uh, explored. Um, there, Sylvia mentions uh, systems of care and uh, demography, at the question of demography. Again, in relation to, I think, in relation to the economic situation we are in, but also in terms of the mobility that has, that has uh, Increased or in, or uh, has risen when we have you know travel is so much more easier. There's also the question of uh, criminality and illegality, in particular question or the problem of drugs. Um, okay, so with that, let's um, there we can go to the third, which is uh, moving forward, and of course in everybody's minds, everyone's minds, it, it's the question of sustainability. So, and, and these are all interrelated. You have immediately, you know, we talk about resources and the, the limited or vanishing sources of, res of, uh, of uh, resources. 
that in fact is also related to the question of the status of Asian Center or uh, sorry Asian studies or area studies in general as far as the global academic community is concerned or in a way it was also mentioned the north south uh, the north south uh, divide so here um, it was raised so the the institutional um, the challenges of institutional uh, institutional funding you know is, is uh, has, has has come up and so there has been a uh, there has been many suggestions on how do we actually go around even if we do realize that we do need uh, to promote and to study how we can in fact develop institutional funding but there's also question uh, um, suggestions of decentralization going into like smaller uh, smaller activities at this point just to sustain um, to sustain um, uh, interest and uh, activity and, and, and the solid solidarity or uh, of uh, the community there is also decentralization in terms of uh, so in terms of smaller activities that are collaborative there is also the question of a uh, uh, training or developing our young scholars that will be the next generation. Um, of course, uh, C Asia has, has said this, but also, and is doing this in fact, but also Alada mentioned that they've already begun, uh, you know, having or sponsoring uh, mentoring. But also I think Hilary and, uh, and uh, Angeline mentioned, which is, you know, the value of mentoring that in, that in a sense would de develop the kind of appreciation that we have of course, this two things have come to mind. One is the fact that, in a way, the importance or how we do Asian studies depend on, and this has been repeated throughout the conference, is where we are, right? To such a geographic base, especially in regards to Alada, in terms of like North America, Southeast Asia, it does define uh, how we conduct Asian studies, how we promote, and how we sustain. But outside of the outside of the geographic um, place where we are, there's there's also a lot of uh, interest in terms to how do we, in fact, given this, uh, given this, uh, what we have right now, which is bringing together the different uh, networks. The diff, you know, we're all, and we're again very happy to provide this uh, this uh, this space. Uh, I was, I was just saying, for instance, like in many of the conferences that we have international regional conferences, the theme has been Asia in, in transition or Asia in, in, at the crossroad. In, so in other words, we're all in fact grappling with the changes, rapid changes that is happening in, in Asia. That is in the future will be something that is going to occupy a major a place in the in the in the world stage, so maybe uh, as as has been mentioned by Sylvia that you know Southeast Asia, and Asia in fact the problem of like job employment, the problem of sustaining academic courses, um, maybe later on because of what is happening and uh, the trends and the and the emerging uh, new patterns of uh, development, new patterns of engagement, new patterns of social activism. If we if we actually come together and, and and show how the rest of the world can actually learn from Asia, um, and in fact provide that kind of bridges, like you know Asia and Latin America are are, are, are are two again not only for Latin America but even with Asia Latin America is 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 so far away so there really will there's a lot of you know space to actually try to bring together and have this conversation and dialogue uh, among us in area studies or Asian studies would be a very good starting point. Um, so we, we will, and, and uh, the Asian Center, uh, we come up with, a, with the proceedings. We will, we will uh, document the, the discussion that we've had so that in, in the, we, we do want to put in print uh, what we've discussed so that others who are not able to join us and for us ourselves who would have the document which we can use as a as a starting point for as everybody's saying we do want to have 
we do want to continue the conversation. And I think we've just barely scratched the surface. So I think this is a very good start. The second thing, and this my my last point is that uh, the Asian Center, in fact, with this webinar, we are in fact launching a webinar series on new directions for South uh, new directions for Asian studies. In other words, the conversation here will not start and end here. It is a series that we do want to sustain. And we do want to invite uh, also others, individuals and institutions, critical individuals, leading scholars, uh, to have that kind of a discussion. So we hope that we will, you will all stay engaged in, in, the, in the process that we are in the Asian Center is going through. Thank you so much to everyone. Thanks, Professor Rakiza. Uh, finally, uh, for some closing remarks, we have uh, uh, Dr. Hindelito Sevilla Jr. Uh, the dean of the asian center thank you very much uh, professor uh, lopez and good evening everyone i hope that everybody's still okay and kicking <laughs> okay so this evening we have been fortunate to have eight regional and international networks that have worked to promote interest in and produce new knowledge in asia mobilizing in the process scholars, researchers, and practitioners in and beyond the regions to form a broad and diverse epistemic community concerned with where Asia is today and where it is heading. Furthermore, it is a privilege for the Asian Center to be able to provide a space for the meeting of minds, the exploration of common research agendas, and identification of the works that lies ahead for the Asian studies community. Uh, for sharing with us their perspectives on and experiences in the study of Asia, especially of those from the regions, I would like to express our profound thanks to our distinguished speakers, Dr. Jeronimo Delgado Caicedo and Dr. Lia Rodriguez de la Viga of the Latin American Association of Asian and African Studies, Dr. Angeline Chang of International Political Science Association, Dr. Hilary Pinchan Sang of the Association of Asian Studies, Dr. Uh, Brendan Hall of the Asian Political and International Studies Association, Dr. Michael uh, Shaw uh, of the Conception of Southeast Asian Studies in Southeast Asia, Hi. Dr. Philip Haycom of the International Institute for Asian Studies and Dr. Selva Bignato of the European Association for Southeast Asian Studies. To all of you, our deepest appreciation and thanks. For the Asian Center that is celebrating our 66th anniversary this month, we will take the analysis and suggestions arising from this evening's discussions as input to our strategic planning process that we will be undertaking in order to ensure the continuing relevance of our academic courses, research and policy works. To end, uh, let me just say that the coming together uh, today or tonight of six regional networks shows that even while the pandemic has widened physical and social division within and between countries, it has also forced us to creatively rethink social connectivity. This roundtable, which brings speakers and audience from different time zones, is a positive testament to the new possibilities of intellectual exchange. Again, this roundtable is the first installment of the webinar series, as uh, mentioned by Professor Rakiza on new directions for Asian studies. And I am sure that everyone will agree with me when I say that we have made important connections here that will help us move the conversation forward. Rest assured that we are already working on the webinars in this series that we plan to hold in the coming months. Again, to our speakers, as well as to the Asian Center faculty and staff that work to make, to make this program happen. And to everyone who took time out to join us, maraming salamat, magandang gabi, 
and good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dean Sevilla. And that ends our round table. But um, I think before we, maybe we can have another, a final photo, um, especially because uh, I think Hillary was not in the, in the initial group photo. Um, can I, can I just... Yes, yes, Professor Rakiza. So I, I just like to apologize to Michael. So uh, it is Southeast Asian Studies in Asia. So we start corrected. Sorry, we are actually a founding member, so shame on us. Thank you. Okay, I understand. <laughs> so. Okay. Okay, so let me take the picture. Okay, one, two, three, smile everyone. Okay, one more. One, two, three, smile. All right, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Well, yep. evening for you. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 So bye. wonderful. Hola. Thank you.